Hi, I'm Meredith Hutchison Hartley, and welcome back to the Hidden History of Business podcast. Today we're going to be discussing the history of agriculture and pesticides, specifically one amazing crop that changed the entire world, particularly triggering the Industrial Revolution, and that is the potato. If you haven't read Charles C. Mann's book 1493, Uncovering the New World Columbus Created, I highly recommend it. I'll be pulling some information from his book, as well as from the Cambridge History of Food and a lot of other sources. You can learn more about those sources on our website. So we know that potatoes have been cultivated for at least 9,000 years. We have uh, Mm -hmm. potato remains that go all the way back to 4,500 years ago in Peru. We know that fossilized remains have been found on the floors of canyons in Peru going back at least 7,000 years. And today the potato is the fourth most important world crop food. The only ones that are considered more important are wheat, rice, and maize or corn. It originated in the Andes and... It didn't originate in the form that we know it today. It's had it's an extremely diverse plant. In fact, the Peruvian language records have more than a thousand different words to describe potatoes and potato varieties. The International Potato Institute in Peru has preserved more than five thousand varieties of potato. They know that it was believed to have medicinal qualities, and in some cases they would cut the potato and they would rub it on people's skin when they were ill, thinking that it would work as a remedy. It's an important crop because compared to wheat or rice, they are an extremely productive plant. When any other crop that is grown above ground gets too heavy, it starts to fall over and it can break the stalk. That's why you see tomatoes growing in those V-shaped cages like cones. It's why people are so concerned about people running through their cornfields and breaking down the stalks. Because once a crop stalk breaks, it stops growing. It doesn't replace itself, and you've lost that crop. But potatoes grow underground, and they can continue growing for an extremely long time as long as there are nutrients in the soil, which means you don't have to worry about fungi or bacteria or people hurting your potato as long as the ground is good. In fact, Charles Mann notes in his book that in 2008, a Lebanese farmer dug up a potato that weighed nearly 25 pounds and was bigger than his head. Potatoes also have some natural protections from being eaten by uh, animals or humans who don't know better. Potatoes contain solanine and tomatine in their natural form, and these are poisonous compounds that protect the plant against these different organisms attacking it. When you cook the potato, it breaks those chemicals down But solanine and tomatine really can be unaffected by heat. A lot of animals in Peru, um, particularly relatives of the llama, would lick clay before they eat poisonous plants. And this natural clay would absorb these toxins, and the clay would pass through the animal stomachs completely unharmed and unaffected, and they could eat these plants, which is how they survived in these, these very rugged mountain environments. It reached the point that mountain peoples in Peru would start dunking their wild potatoes into a mixture of clay and water until they figured out how to breed potatoes that weren't so toxic. Some of these old varieties still remain, and people like them because, especially at higher altitudes, they don't react to frost. And when they're sold, Charles Mann even notes that clay dust is still sold in Peru and Bolivia when they sell these wild potatoes. People still eat them that way. Now, native Peruvian and Bolivians uh, used potatoes in a lot of ways. They were boiled, peeled, chopped, dried. They fermented them. They crushed them up into a pulp, soaked them in water, and squeezed them to get out the potato starch in a dried, fine powder. And there's one interesting method where they would lay them out at night to freeze and then let them thaw in the sun and repeat this process over and over again until the potato was kind of a mushy pulp. Then you could squeeze all the water out, let it dry, and you'd be left was something kind of like, uh, they describe it like gnocchi, the small uh, potato dumplings in Italian cuisine. The cool thing about these these little dumplings called chunyo is that they can survive without refrigeration for years. Uh, Incan armies marched on chunyo. These potatoes that they were eating weren't like our modern ones. In Peru, in the Andes, uh, different altitudes will produce different varieties of potatoes. In fact, the farmers there now grow the potatoes that we eat here in the United States, but they're nothing like what they grow for themselves to eat. They consider our potatoes bland, tough. In fact, uh, one site describes them as for city folks. The potato in South America isn't necessarily one specific plant. It's a variety of connected and related vegetables. 
We know that in the 1500s, the Spanish conquistadors come to Peru and they conquer the area. And they discover the natives eating these potatoes and all these different flavors. The Spaniards arrived, led by Francisco Pizarro. In 1532, they landed in Peru, and they noticed that the natives were eating these little round objects. Within three decades, they were becoming popular in France and the Netherlands. We know that in uh, 1596, Swiss naturalist Gaspard Bouhin named the potato and did a study of it that was published in the Swiss press. We don't know exactly when they came to Europe. There is a lot of speculations. The Spaniards took them back to Spain, and then they spread throughout the Mediterranean and then north. We do know that by the 1580s, in the Canary Islands, farmers were cultivating potatoes and exporting them to England and other locations. We don't know the exact route the potato took. We do know that by the end of the 1500s, they were gaining some popularity in Europe. We know that in the early 1600s, by I think it's 1609, European sailors were taking the potato to China because they understood that it could survive on these long voyages. And a hundred years later, by 1719, the potato arrived in the United States. The cool thing about the potato is that when it arrived in Northern Europe, it ended famines. Um, corn did something similar in Southern Europe, uh, Charles Mann notes. But the potato was particularly important because it could grow very, very quickly and it could survive in soil m much more heartily than corn or wheat or any other crop. The Spaniards arrived, led by Francisco Pizarro. In 1532, they landed in Peru and they noticed that the natives were eating these little round objects. Within three decades, they were becoming popular in France and the Netherlands. We know that in uh, 1596, Swiss naturalist Gaspard Bouhin named the potato and did a study of it that was published in the Swiss press. But there was a lot of controversy about what it was. Some people thought it was an aphrodisiac. Uh, they tried using it as a cure for all sorts of different ailments, from the common cold to leprosy to acne. In Denis Diderot's encyclopedia that was published in 1751, it was the very first time that someone had taken all this enlightenment scientific thought and they'd put it together into a single volume. And he wrote that he didn't really know what to do with the potato. He said it didn't taste very well. It was starchy. And it seems to be a reasonably healthy food. In fact, he said it cannot be regarded as an enjoyable food, but it provides abundant, reasonably healthy food for men who want nothing but sustenance. He also said it was windy, meaning that it caused gas. But in his words, what is windiness to the strong bodies of peasants and laborers? So it wasn't good for the wealthy, but it was good enough for those, those peasants and serfs. Now, by the mid-1700s, Prussia was getting hit by a terrible famine. And King Frederick the Great, who liked potatoes himself, started ordering the peasantry to eat potatoes. And that's when it really started catching on. In England, during the same time, farmers were pushing against potatoes because they said that it was a, a sign of popism and Catholicism, which they were very strongly against. In fact, the slogan was no potatoes, no popery for an election in 1765. France was slow, England was slow to adopt it. But even though France and England and Ireland were slow to adopt the potato, Germany had latched onto it. And this became a pretty big deal during the Seven Years' War. A pharmacist named uh, Antoine Augustin Parmiente discovered the potato when he was held captive by the Germans. And prisoners at the time were fed potatoes, and they would cook them a trillion different ways. But he learned the value of the potato then. And as a, an early pharmacist, he started studying why people were, these prisoners were able to survive on the potatoes. Even though it was a very limited food, they still stayed in pretty good health. So when the war ended and he went back to France, he became a fixture in the court of King Louis. And he was crowned in 1775. At the time, there had been these controls on the prices of grain so that the prices couldn't shoot up too high during this critical war. They didn't want to fight insane inflation and destroy their economy while they were dealing with problems abroad. But as soon as he lifted the price controls, the cost of bread skyrocketed and started what was called the flour war. There were hundreds of fights, riots that broke out in dozens of towns across France. Parmentier stepped in saying, hey, I've got a solution for this. We can stop these riots about bread if we can introduce a new crop. And that crop really should be the potato. Let me tell you why it's awesome. So he started doing these publicity stunts 
particularly knowing that people would adopt the potato if they stopped viewing it as this low-class root and as something fancy and aspirational. So Parmentier started hosting all potato dinners for the wealthy aristocrats. In fact, depending on, on the records you read, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, during their stays in France, were guests at Parmentier's dinners. In fact, they believe that that is where they discovered this idea of frying potatoes and brought that back to the United States. Don't believe anyone who tells you that Ben Franklin or Thomas Jefferson introduced the potato to the U.S. It had been around since at least 1719. But what they did do is they took the potato from being something that poor farmers on the frontier were using, and by the early 1800s, Thomas Jefferson was serving it in the White House. That's what made potatoes so important, was the aristocrats adopted them as a response to price wars in France. It finally escalated to the point that the king and queen of France started wearing potato blossoms as a, a trend. Uh, Marie Antoinette wore potato blossoms in her hair. There's even a pretty apocryphal story that King Louis stuck a potato blossom in his butthole, uh, saying that it would make his, his farts more flowery and special. So suddenly the entire court was wearing potato blossoms. They planted 40 acres of potatoes in Paris, and they knew that if people were hungry, they would come and they would steal the potatoes. And that's exactly what happened. Charles Mann notes that even though Parmentier was trying to promote the potato, he says he unwittingly changed it to, quote, all of Europe's potatoes descended from a few tubers sent across the ocean by curious Spaniards. When farmers planted pieces of tuber rather than seeds, the resulted plants were, were clones. By urging potato cultivation on a mass scale, Parmentier was unknowingly promoting the notion of planting huge areas with clones, and he created monoculture, this idea that instead of planting a variety of crops on the same land, we would plant giant fields of a single crop, and that monoculture persists today. When people began to realize the potato was pretty versatile, it happened by accident. In 1853, a railway magnate, Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, uh, sent his serving of potatoes back at a swanky restaurant. Now, the, the rumors that this was in Saratoga Springs. The story goes that he rejected them because they were cut too thick. And this really angered the chef, George Crum, who viewed it as an assault on his ego. To get back at him, he sliced them teeny tiny thin, fried them in super hot oil, and drenched them in salt before sending them back to Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt. He thought that he was going to trick him and give him a horrible salty mouthful, but Vanderbilt loved them. He referred to them as crunch chips, and that's where the rumor is that potato chips came from. The adoption by the aristocracy was important because it popularized potatoes for others. The real impact, the, the value potatoes provided, weren't just a fad. They estimate that between 1500 and 1800, Europe dealt with more than 40 nationwide famines. That's more than one every 10 years. And they think it's really an underestimate because we're only talking national famines. It emits possibly thousands of small local famines that in the past had destroyed entire populations. France was not exceptional in that. England had at least 17 national and big regional famines between 1523 and 1623. That's in 100 years. They had 17 giant famines. Europe was very susceptible to changes in their agriculture, but the potato ended that. So in the past, farmers had had to leave ground fallow, which means that they didn't plant on it. They had to rotate their crops because when you plant corn in a field, it uses up a lot of nutrients and you have to let that soil rest before you can plant something else there. Or you have to rotate your crops. You can't plant the same thing every year in the same field. It won't keep growing. What they discovered is that instead of leaving land fallow, they could plant potatoes there instead. It would grow, the soil would still rest, it would prevent weeds from growing up, and they still had food. So these smaller farmers were growing potatoes on fallow land, they were controlling the weeds, and they had this giant food supply. So the potato became so dominant that it was the major solid food that these populations ate. As it grew in popularity all the way through the 1800s, they started to run into trouble. By the early 1800s, the potato was showing a tendency towards crop failure, and Ireland and Northern Europe dealt with the brunt of it. 
And this eventually led up to the Great Potato Famine, which we'll discuss in a minute. But they didn't really notice the problem growing because there was so much exchange, there was so much trade, that every time a small population lost their potatoes, there was enough surplus that they could purchase them from other places. Ireland became the most vulnerable, though, because unlike other areas, they were growing only one type of potato, and that was the Irish lumper. Other regions had at least two varieties of potato, but Ireland only had one. And that leads us into what would eventually be the potato famine. Now, we already discussed that soil needs to be replenished uh, when you grow certain crops in it, but potatoes didn't have that problem. This leads to the idea of pesticides and fertilizers. The potato wasn't Peru's only contribution to international and industrialized agriculture. Its other huge contribution was guano as fertilizer. In Peru, there are these dozens and dozens of islands off the southern coast. Nothing really grows on these kind of rocky islands, except they tend to attract schools of fish. And because of that, seabirds hang out around these islands to eat those fish, and they cover the islands in this layer of guano. Now, guano is uh, what happens when that, that white urine, the, the pee and poop that birds excrete, when it dries, it leaves behind solids that are guano. And over millennia, these islands were covered in, in some cases, hundreds of feet of guano. And the interesting thing about guano is that it's a great fertilizer. It has a lot of nitrogen in it. And plants need nitrogen so that they can produce chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is what they need so that they can convert the sun's energy into food and, and energy. Nitrogen is all around us. It's in the air we breathe. It's in the chemicals we find in nature. But it's not accessible in all of its forms. The air that we breathe in that has nitrogen in it can't be used by plants because the nitrogen atoms are so close together, plants can't break them apart. So they have to get nitrogen from other sources where it's not bonded so closely. So plants tend to absorb it from ammonia or nitrates in the soil. But that's a problem because soil doesn't just sit there. The bacteria and the other factors in the uh, soil actually digest nitrates themselves. So when you grow something there, you're using up the nitrates and you need more if you're going to grow on a large scale. By 1840, a chemist named Justus Kant von Liebig wrote about this idea that plants need nitrogen. And he also mentioned that, hey, there's a lot of that in guano. And that started a rush on guano. Suddenly, every farmer wanted it, and they wanted a lot of it, especially large plantation owners and the, the earliest industrial farmers, the folks who were starting to use steam engines and other equipment in their agriculture. They discovered when they used guano, their yields doubled or tripled. Over the next 40 years, so by 1880, we're talking just after the Civil War, Peru exported more than 13 tons of guano. Now, they did it using mostly slave labor from China. Charles Mann notes that journalists started to expose the horrible working conditions that these Chinese slaves were working in, but the farmers didn't really care about that. They focused their outrage. They co-opted the scandal instead to talk about how it was unfair that Peru had a monopoly on guano. Peru was charging decent prices. They knew that they had a very, very valuable commodity, and they wanted to be paid appropriately for it. But the U.S. wanted more and more guano, and they wanted it cheaper. Congress took action. They actually decided they were going to invade these guano islands. They were going to seize them. In 1856, they passed the Guano Islands Act. This is a real act of Congress, folks. It said the, that any U.S. merchant or military vessel could seize any guano deposits they discovered anywhere. By the early 1900s, U.S. merchants had seized nearly 100 islands, atolls, coral reefs, uh, coral heads. This sounds kind of crazy to us, but we have to realize that agriculture was the basis for the entire world economy at that time. They felt about guano the way that we feel about petroleum and oil now. Because a country's agriculture in the past was determined by how fertile its soil was, and that was a limited commodity. There was only so much nitrogen, only so many nutrients in the soil, you would use them up and you'd have to wait for them to come back. But suddenly there was an option to actually add something to your soil that would add more nitrogen. That changed the perspective on agriculture from being, we need to work the land and adapt to it and make peace to it, to what can we dump into the soil so that we can keep enhancing it? We can now control this. 
that mattered. Potatoes and fertilizers completely changed living standards. Mann notes that before potatoes, the living conditions in Europe and the United States were comparable to what the average citizen of Bangladesh has today. On average, European, he says, on average, European peasants ate less per day than hunting and gathering societies in Africa or the Amazon. That's where they were pre-potato. The average serf was eating less than people who were in hunting and gathering societies in South America and Africa. But this idea of monoculture, bringing in giant fields of the same crop that could, and the soil being replenished, allowed literally billions of people to escape poverty. It gave them sustenance. It prevented diseases. Between potatoes and guano, living standards doubled or tripled worldwide even while the population was expanding. In fact, he notes that the human numbers climbed from fewer than 1 billion in 1700 to some 7 billion today. So in just 300 years, that's a 6 billion person increase. But all of this finally culminated in the potato famine. Now, it's only been um, in less than 10 years that they've really discovered the source of the potato famine. A particular microorganism called Phytophthora infestans, uh, or the vexing plant destroyer, is this microorganism that preys on nightshade plants. So it's looking for potatoes, eggplants, tomatoes, other things that tend to grow low to the ground or in the ground. It started in Peru, this microorganism. And then it somehow traveled to Antwerp, and then it hit France, and then it moved all across Northern Europe uh, in both directions. It moved towards the Netherlands, Germany, it went to, all the way to Ireland. Before 1845, there were 2 million acres of potatoes in Ireland. In just two months, P. infestans wiped out nearly three quarters of a million acres, and it kept going. For seven years, it destroyed potato crops, and each year was worse than the last. Uh, he notes that over a million Irish died, and to help the readers understand that, he says that today that would be 40 million people in the United States dying. That's the equivalent effect on the population. Now, those, that million died, but 2 million people left Ireland coming to the U.S., and that's significant. 3 million people disappeared from the Irish population in just a decade. Even 100 years later, they st Ireland still has a population that is half of what it was before the potato famine. But the potato famine wasn't the, the end of potatoes' troubles. There was another issue called the Colorado potato beetle. This is a little orange and black beetle that's native to south central Mexico, where it eats a relative of the potato plant called the buffalo burr. But it really wasn't a problem anywhere else for, for centuries, really, until it started to be carried north into what is now the United States by cattle and horses that the Spanish introduced. And this really culminated in the 1860s. Let's, let me remind you that is simultaneous with the Civil War in the United States. In the 1860s, it hit the area of the Missouri River and found these monocultured fields of potatoes. And that was a smorgasbord, man. It was, it was Christmas and Thanksgiving rolled into one for the Colorado potato beetle. It fed like crazy. And then it hitched a ride on the railways, on the steam engines in the United States as these troops traversed the, the continent. And it covered everywhere. They bred quickly and they became so prevalent that there were reports of entire beaches on the East Coast being smothered in these orange beetles. Some trains literally had to stop and couldn't move because the tracks were covered in beetles that would completely derail the trains. And they couldn't get rid of them. They tried everything. They tried everything that they'd considered a pesticide. They tried smashing them. Nothing worked. The legend is that one day a farmer threw green paint out into his field just to try to get rid of a few of them, and suddenly they all died. The primary pigment in that paint was something called Paris green, a combination of arsenic and copper, and they discovered that it could kill them. So people started taking this pigment, this parent's green, and they would mix it with flour and they'd dust the potatoes, or they would mix it in water, they'd spray everything. This was the beginning of industrial pesticides, and it worked so well that chemists throughout the world started saying, hey, what else can we use this for? 
And they did. They developed newer and newer pesticides, and farmers grabbed them and ate them up and used them on everything they could because it was better than dying. And that was the very real problem that they were fighting. We talk a lot today about the safety of pesticides, but particularly in the United States, we don't struggle with famine and food shortage in the way that they did then. The introduction of pesticides literally saved millions from certain death from famine at a time when food was not guaranteed, when particularly a famine that corresponded with a major war could have devastated entire nations. Now, people didn't really start to notice until that in the early 1900s, pea infestans and other pests were starting to show immunity to certain pesticides. That's because they were developing newer and newer pesticides, but it really culminated in the 1980s because there's a new kind of pea infestans, the same thing that caused the potato famine, and it's resistant to pesticides, and we don't have a solution. Some of you who garden may remember that about six years ago, all throughout the eastern U.S., potatoes, tomatoes, uh, eggplants and a host of other vegetables were wiped out. Entire gardens were just destroyed. And that was this new form of pea infestans that just wiped out everything. And that's the culmination of where we came from. That's how the potato grew throughout history and led to monoculture to the idea of, of single fields being used for a single crop. It led to fertilizers. It led to pesticides. And it shaped the entire concept of where our modern agriculture is today. We talk a lot in quality about how today's problems come from yesterday's solutions. And that's really where we're sitting in modern agriculture. We have a system that grew up as many solutions to deadly problems, problems that killed millions and millions of people and really the solutions that saved lives and by understanding where that came from hopefully we can find better solutions to the problems we're facing now if you'd like to learn more about the subject that we discussed today you can find multimedia content links to articles we discussed and videos on our website at www.hiddenhistoryofbusiness.com you can also find us on Facebook as The Hidden History of Business and on Twitter as well. Thanks for listening.